73% of those who go daily or weekly believe in the real presence. That number drops to about 23% of those who almost never go. That then has a, an effect also on how often you go to confession. 37% of all Catholics go to confession. But then we're getting into single digits with those who do not attend Mass on a regular basis. Very interesting indeed what we don't understand anymore. But confession is a part of our human fabric. It is just kind of part of who we are. We're always in need. In fact, we will say to people, uh, you know, it takes a big boy and a big girl to say I'm sorry. Welcome to the Father Leo Show, where I'm dishing out faith, culture, and commentary. And in this episode, we're gonna talk about the need for true divine mercy from Jesus Christ, as well as explore a little bit about the life of Saint Faustina Kowalska, because guess what? I am actually in Poland right now leading a group of pilgrims. And before we jump into our comments about faith and divine mercy, I wanna say thanks to all of those who support and subscribe to our channel. Make sure if you haven't done so yet, click subscribe. Honestly, it takes but a second and it helps us to grow our audience. When you make your comments, guess what? You YouTube likes that because it shows that there's actually engagement. And by the way, we read these comments and helps us to improve in our show and understanding how we can dish out for you faith, culture, and good commentary that's not going to make you mad, but help to form you to be a, a, a thoughtful Christian living in the midst of this world, to be able to deal with all the craziness. And that's why we need God's mercy. And by the way, mercy comes by way of supporting our channel. So please, if you haven't done so yet, uh, go to our Patreon page and help us out with your monthly donation. You're gonna get access to even more content as well as special perks, as well as even perks to come on a future pilgrimage with me. So let's just jump right into it with this Divine Mercy Sunday special edition and my comments about faith. Sister Maria Faustina Kowalska was born in the 19, in early 1900s, and in 1930s she received a special kind of a calling by the Lord. She was visited by Jesus, and basically, let's do this. Let's just watch this little video. It's very pious. Uh, I'll admit that I try to be a very pious person but this is at least good information about who this saint is. Oh, and by the way, for anyone who does subscribe to our Patreon, you're gonna get some kind of exclusive content as we're gonna be filming a little bit in the Divine Mercy Shrine. So make sure you support us on Patreon. So let's learn a little bit more about Saint Faustina Kowalska. Saint Maria Faustina Kowalska of the Blessed Sacrament was born as Helena Kowalska in Poland on August 25, 1905. After finishing her schooling, Faustina wanted to immediately join a convent, but her parents refused. In 1924, Faustina experienced her first vision of Jesus. He instructed her to leave for Warsaw immediately and join a convent. While in Warsaw, the Mother Superior for the Congregation of the Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy decided to accept Faustina, if she could pay for her own religious habit. In 1926, she received her habit and took the religious name of Sister Maria Faustina of the Blessed Sacrament, and in 1928, she took her first religious vows as a nun. On February 22, 1931, Faustina was visited by Jesus, who presented himself as the King of Divine Mercy while wearing a white garment with red and pale rays coming from his heart. In her diary, Faustina writes, After a while, Jesus said to me, Paint an image according to the pattern you see, with the inscription, Jesus, I trust in you. Three years later, in 1934, the first painting of the image was created by Eugene Kazimierowski. After taking her final vows in 1933, Faustina met Father Michael Sapaco, the appointed confessor to the nuns. Learning of her conversations with Jesus, Father Sapaco insisted she be evaluated by a psychiatrist. Faustina passed all tests and was determined sane. Sapaco then encouraged her to start keeping a diary and record all her conversations with Jesus. After two years of feeling ill, Faustina passed away on October 5, 1938. 
She currently rests at the Basilica of Divine Mercy in Krakow, Poland. Her diary, Divine Mercy in My Soul, has become the handbook for devotion to the Divine Mercy, and the Divine Mercy image continues to be one of the most recognized images of mercy. St. Faustina's entire life, in imitation of Christ's, was to be a sacrifice, a life lived for others. St. Faustina Kowalska was beatified on April 18, 1993, and canonized on April 30, 2000, both by Pope St. John Paul II. Her feast day is celebrated on October 5th, and she is the patron saint of mercy. Again, a pious recounting of who this great saint is, and really, it was all about what Jesus did for her in these private revelations. And, you know, in previous episodes, we talked about what private revelations mean. Again, you technically don't have to believe in this private revelation that Jesus appeared to St. Faustina. You don't. You can still be a good Catholic, but you can't make fun of this. You can't diminish its importance. In fact, private revelations, when approved by the church, can help increase devotion for you. It's almost like the little signs that Jesus gives to us because we're constantly asking for whether or not God is real and can God forgive the greatest sinner? The answer is yes. And this Feast of Divine Mercy is a chance for all people who experience sin in their life, including me, to beg for God's mercy. And so here's what we need to do because it falls on the sand, the Sunday after Easter Sunday. So basically tomorrow, if you're watching the show when it's released. And so basically what we've got to do is in 2024 at least, the Feast of Divine Mercy is on Sunday, the uh, April the 7th. Just so that you know that again, that's tomorrow if you're watching the show when it is released. But here's what we need to do in order to obtain this divine mercy. Sincerely repent for our sins, place complete trust in Jesus, go to confession, preferably before the feast day itself, receive Holy Communion the day of the feast or its vigil, venerate the image of the divine mercy, and be merciful to others through our actions, words, and prayers on, beha on their behalf. And, and what we also have to do is make sure if to receive this plenary indulgence, which is a, a full pardon of all of our sins, we're supposed to uh, receive Holy Communion worthily and then also go to confession and be in the state of grace. And the usual things is also have to pray for the Pope. And that has to happen within this kind of time frame. Now, I know that we're going to be completely imperfect in doing so, but I think God even understands we're making an effort. Because you will never be forgiven if you don't ask for it. It's kind of just as simple as that. And I want to let you know that I am personally connected to the miracle that proclaimed Blessed Faustina to Saint Faustina. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in my commentary. But what I want to do right now is jump into the culture and what people in the world think about divine mercy. So here are my commentaries on culture and mercy. Clearly the Catholic Church is the only religion that really promotes confession as one of the sacraments simply because Jesus told the disciples to go out into all the world, you know, to forgive sins. If you forgive them, they'll be forgiven. If you hold them bound, they will be held bound. In other words, Jesus gave to the church the institution for reconciliation. And this is a beautiful term because it's in it is cilia, so reconcilia, and that means eyelashes. So when someone is reconciled, they are close to another person that their eyelashes can touch. That's the intimacy that Jesus wants for all of us. But sin, in a sense, separates us from the face of God, where in reconciliation, we behold the face of God that even our eyelashes touch that's how close God wants to be with us. But the world is so interesting because the world doesn't believe in true forgiveness. And so here is an interesting poll study uh, from the Pew Research about what Catholic Catholics think about reconciliation these days. 
from this point? Well, the, uh, from a Catholic standpoint, the devotional and sacramental practice of Catholics is of intense interest to uh, us as a network, but it should be of interest to all Catholics. What we found, in, in exactly as we did in 2020, that 50 percent of Catholics believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. That number shifts significantly, however, depending upon how often you actually go to Mass, so that 73 percent of those who go daily or weekly believe in the real presence. That number drops to about 23 percent to those who almost never go. That then has a, an effect also on how often you go to confession. 37% of all Catholics go to confession. But then we're getting into single digits with those who do not attend Mass on a regular basis. That's uh, important as a teaching moment for us, but it also then has this impact on how you're viewing the world, how you're viewing things like Roe v. Wade, and likely how you're going to vote. Very interesting indeed what we don't understand anymore. But confession is a part of our human fabric. It is just kind of part of who we are. We're always in need. In fact, we will say to people, uh, you know, it takes a big boy and a big girl to say I'm sorry. In this world, we're almost like forced to not believe that forgiveness is real. And here is a, a beautiful presentation by Bishop Barron. We live in a culture that, as Cardinal Francis George said, permits everything and yet forgives nothing. And so it is, people despair of being forgiven and feel compelled to deny their guilt. Yet the desire for reconciliation is embedded deep in our broken hearts. We are willing to confess our sins publicly on television or on social media. And in this cacophonous lament, we are longing for absolution. The truth is, we've all sinned against ourselves, against each other, against God. God in Christ reveals that his mercy does not abandon us to guilt, but calls us like Lazarus to come forth from the grave of our sin and find in his forgiveness the chance to live again. In the sacrament of reconciliation, God's merciful plan gives us a living encounter with his presence, which is forgiveness, which is mercy. Through the ministry of the church, we hear the very voice of Christ declaring, go in peace, your sins are forgiven. It is dramatic music, because it honestly is kind of dramatic. I wanna tell a story, because it is a true story about a young man who came to me for confession. And again, I'm not, allowed to disclose who it is, nor disclose what this person confessed. If I were to do so, I would actually be in spiritual peril. I would, would be excommunicated from the church and possibly go to hell. Uh, it, in other words, I take the role of confessor incredibly seriously. But this young man comes to me conf to confession, and he was a very impressive person young man, very athletic. You could tell he was smart just by the way he spoke. Uh, very handsome and very kind of um, much a leader. He would be kind of the person that you'd be proud to have as your son, for example. And he came to me for confession and, and he got very emotional because he was just declaring his brokenness and his sins before God and the church that has been given the grace to forgive those sins. In other words, he was realizing who he was and he was acknowledging the good he failed to do and the evil he chose to do. And it was a beautiful moment. And as I absolved him of his sins, he slapped me high five. It's God's honest truth. And, and he said, Father Leo, that was awesome. I'm not even Catholic, and that was awesome. And you're like, wait a minute, is that, is that a legitimate confession that just happened? And the answer is yes, it's 100% valid. He was forgiven of his sins. You don't actually have to be Catholic to experience the grace of confession or God's mercy. Now, obviously, if you are going to confession, it's because you believe that the Catholic Church has the power to forgive sins by Jesus Christ. So why not just become Catholic? And, you know, that is actually a good first step 
in order to become a Catholic, we have to recognize it's not a hotel for saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. That's what it is. And, and the beauty of the churches, especially the magnificent cathedrals and shrines and basilicas that we have are just sim simple glimpses of what the beauty of heaven is going to be like. And we go there unworthy. That's why we're actually beating our breasts and saying, I'm not worthy. Have mercy on me. Forgive me of my sins. For my sins, my sins, and all of my sins. And so you can see that while a lot of the world judges Catholics as uprighteous and uptight and, and you know, righteous and uptight and very kind of holy, roly, judgy people, that's the exact opposite. We know we are sinners and we are all in need of God's divine mercy. And, and it's interesting because this, this beautiful, beautiful time to forgive right after Easter is, is really showing us that, that Jesus wants us all to experience heaven. And the only way we're gonna experience heaven is if we tell the truth about who we are. We're sinners, but yet God gives us great mercy. And so in this desire to be forgiven, we need to know who to ask it from. Oftentimes we, we will say, you need to ask forgiveness from the person that you've offended, and that's confession. But what if that person doesn't forgive you, or if you don't have a chance to go to that person because they live far away or they've died? What can happen? Is God's mercy not available to you anymore? No, the answer is go to confession, because confession is God's forgiveness. Remember that when we sin against someone, we've hurt that person, we've hurt ourselves, but we also offend God. But in all of this, this person who I've offended might forgive us, but they can't do it perfectly because they're not perfect. I mean, I just ask you, have you ever forgiven someone perfectly and thrown that sin as far as east is west and made such reconciliation that you give to them what you had with them before. No. But if God allows you to forgive the person who offended you, then that is an experience of divine mercy. But what if this person doesn't forgive or isn't in the picture anymore? Can you still be forgiven? Yes. And a lot of times people say, I need to forgive myself. This is hogwash. You can make excuses for yourself. That's what you can do. The best thing you can do is admit you've done wrong and seek forgiveness. And that's where divine mercy comes into play. And again, our world seeks forgiveness too. That's why they're constantly confessing their brokenness on social media or, or on talk shows. And as Bishop Barron said, uh, it is very easy for the world to promote sin. And as soon as you bite that forbidden fruit, the world is also the first to condemn you and not to forgive you. I mean, I think I remember my spiritual director who kind of quoted Fulton Sheen and said that the devil is always giving you excuses when you sin. And Jesus is always admonishing us not to. But as soon as we sin, the devil is the first to accuse you and Jesus is the first to forgive us. We've got to realize that the sacrament of reconciliation is not an important thing to do. It is necessary for our own sanctification and our salvation. Why do you go to a priest? I know a lot of non-Catholic Christians will question that. Well, guess what? It's because Jesus gave us the power to forgive sins. That's all there is to it. Through the ministry of the apostolic priesthood, we are given the right and therefore the responsibility and incredible pri pri privilege you know, we are taught in the seminary to be as generous with forgiving sins as possible and even giving certain priests, these missionaries of mercy, the ability to absolve even the gravest sins, which at one point were reserved to the bishop himself. And so we've got to realize that God wants people to be reconciled. But, 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 I have to say that uh, I was involved to some degree in the proclamation of canonizing St. Faustina. Let me talk about that now in my commentary. 
I've always been a fan of the Feast of Divine Mercy simply because it just shows that God truly is merciful. And I remember hearing that all of our sins collectively are but a drop of water in this ocean of divine mercy. Think about the power that you have. Uh, excuse me, the power of God's forgiveness that he has on us in order to forgive us of our sins. You know, what's really amazing is that when I was a seminary in 1995, I was a second year seminary at the Pontifical North American College, and I received a letter from a woman who I worked with when I was teaching and coaching speech and debate for a Catholic high school. And this person was kind of a volunteer and served as a, a judge for these speech competitions. Anyway, she was a very faithful person who attended church at Holy Rosary in Baltimore City, which is now kind of a little bit of a shrine for the Divine Mercy celebrations. And by the way, you got to pray for that place because it is possibly, I heard that it might be one of the churches that will be closed in that community will be consolidated with a cluster of churches. It's really sad that many people don't go to this church. It is magnificent. It is beautiful. It is humongous. And it's also the place of divine mercy. And why? Well, because the priest who's there, his name is Father Ron Patel, was supposed to go on a pilgrimage with a group of people to the divine mercy, but he got sick. He actually had some heart major heart problems. And so, uh, unfortunately, he was not able to go, but the pilgrimage group went and they prayed at the Divine Mercy Shrine for his healing. So anyway, I got a letter from this woman named Dottie Olszewski, and she actually wrote to me about this incident that when they went to Divine Mercy Shrine, where I'm going to be going, and I'm going to be letting more people know about it, especially if you're on Patreon, you can get kind of some behind-the-scenes scoop on all of this. While they were praying for him, he was experiencing something in his heart that it was degenerating. His heart was literally breaking down, but during their time of prayer at the shrine while he was in Baltimore, he experienced a strange sensation. He went to the doctor, and the doctors basically said that his heart was regenerating. It was almost like healing itself. And he attributed that, obviously, to God through the intercession of St. Faustina as as the testimony written by Dottie Alzuski and her pilgrimage group. Well, anyway, she sent me this letter accounting for all of this, and guess what? She didn't know what to do with this letter or who to send it to, but she sent it to me because I was in Rome, and what did I do? I went to my spiritual director who was a Vatican official. He read the letter, and he said, you need to take this to the Office of Congregation for Saints. I'm like, ah. I don't even know where to go for that, but he gave me instructions. I dropped that letter off. My job was done. Didn't hear about it until a couple months later when there was a big gathering at the North American College and there were a bunch of officials from the Vatican. And one of them came up to me and he says, are you Leo Padalinga? Yes, I am. He said, I'm Monsignor so-and-so from the Congregation of Saints. And I'm like, would you like a locket of my hair? You know when you want to proclaim me a saint. That's just me being a snippy little seminarian. But then he said, uh, well, you're the one who dropped off the letter about Father Ron Pytel. And he said, we're seriously investigating this potential miracle. And he wanted to thank me for delivering that letter. But he also said that he went to seminary with Father Ron Pytel. And he knew that he was sickly. And he was happy to know that he was recovering so the miracle of Father Ron Pytel, which was examined three years, for three years, was the official miracle that proclaimed Blessed Faustina as St. Faustina Kowalska. And guess what? I was the mule that delivered that good news. Pretty amazing stuff. That's why I have a great devotion to the Divine Mercy image, as well as the promotion of the apparitions and the messages. I will be very honest, I have not read the entire diary, which is like super thick, but I have read parts of it and am very moved by the words that she said came from Jesus. 
and Jesus was all about true forgiveness and true love, which is kind of what this world needs right now. So I just want to challenge you in my commentary. I want to ask you who you need to forgive and give that to God because only God can give you the grace to truly forgive that person. And even then, it won't be perfect because we might hold on to the resentment. It might always play in the back of our minds. But I can guarantee you that if you let God's divine mercy work through you, that brokenness that you experience will be healed and made even stronger the same way a broken bone, when healed, actually becomes stronger. But if their healing is not truly inaccurate, the the healing of the broken bone, if it's not healed properly, will create even more pain for you in the future, which is why we need a mercy that is so complete that it can only really come from God. Don't believe in the secular understanding that I need to forgive myself. You can't. The only thing you can do is recognize that you need forgiveness and go to the one who can forgive you. And then here's what you need to do. Trust that God can forgive you. That's the difference. When psycho, psycho babble says, forgive yourself, don't buy into that. That's the devil saying to you, you are God and you have the power to forgive yourself. No, the only thing you can do is acknowledge your sins and trust that Jesus, who is God, Lord and Savior, can be the one to forgive you. That's why the divine mercy image says Jesus I trust in you because guess what? <laughs> we can't even fully forgive ourselves. I mean, I, I look at my past sins and I'm like, man, I did that. I can't believe I did that. Can I still be forgiven? And the answer is I've got to trust that Jesus can. So I hope that this, this little message on divine mercy gives you a better understanding of an approved apparition and message from the Catholic Church. You are allowed to believe this. You don't have to, but I certainly recommend that you do because it'll help you in understanding how merciful God is to us and therefore the kind of mercy that we're supposed to have on others. This is a very measured, very truly measured understanding of apparitions, kind of these spiritual lessons, but also points to something very practical. I certainly hope that you will celebrate well this Feast of Divine Mercy and make sure that you like, subscribe, share, and comment. All of that really helps us to grow our channel so that we can approach things like Divine Mercy and Private Revelations in a more Catholic and pastoral way. And also supporting us on Patreon will give you some special perks as well as access to some great comment where you can even be formed in God's mercy. I want to say thank you, happy Feast of Divine Mercy, happy continued blessings in the Easter season, and make sure that you always stay hungry for God.